Welcome everyone for being here. What a joy to see so many of you here who have shown up. We're here with us in the room. Those of you who are joining us online, you are all most welcome. My name is Claudia Seymour and I have the great privilege to moderate today's session. Um, we are going to be doing the session the Opportunity and Dignity, Digni Digital Trade for Sustainable Refugee Empowerment Workshop. So my job at the Graduate Institute is as Head of Applied Research Projects and Practice in the interdisciplinary programs. So I've had the opportunity to work with quite a few of you in the room as we help our students bridge their policy, practice, professionalism, and apply what they're studying in the world to the, to the real world. Um, and we would like to thank all of you who are joining us here, both those of you who attended the first workshop as part of the Task Platform's Future of Work Summit, as well as those of you joining us today as part of Geneva Trade Week. I would like to thank all of our ITC partners who are doing such vital work in the refugee empowerment space. Now, today we have a very dynamic lineup. It will consist of two panels, a workshop style discussion in smaller groups. And our first panel will provide an overview of the project, as well as a work of the ITC in the refugee empowerment space. Then we'll hear from those working directly with refugees to improve their access to digital jobs and to find employment. With this context, we'll then break into our discussion groups, including one for our online participants to workshop some of the practical proposals that the project has produced. At the end of the session, we will come back together for some concluding thoughts from Yasmin Chaudhry, the project manager, on the journey so far and the next steps going forward. When we call for questions and answers, we kindly ask for those of you in the room to wait until a microphone is brought to you so that those who are joining us online will be able to hear your question. And for those of you who are joining online, we would please like to ask you to put your question in the Q&A box, which can be accessed by clicking the bottom of the screen. We will then put your questions to our panelists and speakers on your behalf. So with this, we will move to the first part, providing an overview of the topic. I have the pleasure of introducing Dmitry Krozubinsky, the executive director of the Geneva Trade Platform, responsible for organizing the Geneva Trade Week and co-host of today's session for some introductory remarks. Dmitry, the floor is yours. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Juanita. Um, Juanita's job is to yell things at me during our sessions when I inevitably forget things like looking at Q&A or what I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, so thank you again, Claudia. Um, in service of having a dynamic session, I will try to speak as briefly as possible to give you a sense of where this project comes from um, and why an organization like Geneva Trade Platform is doing something in the refugee space. Uh, we are we launched this project in partnership with the Thinking Ahead on Societal Change platform, our sister platform at the Graduate Institute, uh, whose executive director, Katrona Seri, is hiding off stage uh, in our audience. And it really all comes back to Professor Richard Baldwin, who is our shared co-strategic director, but he couldn't join us today. Uh, our role as platforms at the Graduate Institute is mostly to wait until one of the professors says something that could be an idea and then to run around as hard as possible to try to make it one. Uh, in this case, Richard's focus for a very long time has been on what will the future of work look like? And specifically, what will digital empowerment change about how people work? And his thesis, his insight is that the ability to work across borders is going to fundamentally change the nature of the labor market. And when he came to us and said, I have some money, which is always a nice thing to hear, and I want to do something in this space, at that moment, I think a lot of us were, like a lot of people watching the invasion of Ukraine from 
Switzerland and feeling impotent to help. And so we put our heads together and we now all argue about whose idea this actually was, uh, all claiming it was someone else's. But we thought maybe that there is something in this. Uh, my, I moved to Ukraine when I was six years old and we were not refugees, but you know, so Soviet Union moving moving to Australia, um, it, it felt a little bit like it. And I remember for for the first two years, my parents with with all of their qualifications, uh, worked cleaning the houses of rich people, and they were making no money, and they were shunted from job to job. And I remember the moment that they were finally able to work in their own fields. They're computer programmers. And the level of dignity that that brought them, they were able to straighten their backs for the first time in two years. And that's not because of the specific nature of the work they were doing, but that is because they were once again doing what they felt was their vocation. And what we felt, what we suspected was that the era of digital work might allow the subsect of refugees with the skills required to work remotely to be able to do that in the places that they find themselves in. And we wanted to explore that. We wanted to see what was happening in this space. What are the barriers? What are the little tweaks that can be made to existing systems to enable it? And we brought on board Tobias and Yasmin, um, who have exceeded our every conceivable expectation and frankly embarrassed us at every meeting with how much they have been able to progress a project on a shoestring budget working at about five percent i think we were able to pay for their time um and i think what i'm this workshop is about looking at some of the ideas they've pronounced and workshopping them it's about looking at what might be done next um, but I think it's also a testament to just how many actors there are interested in this field and just how much value there is on the table from coming together, from collaboration and from learning from one another's best practices. And I'm, I'm really hopeful that, you know, our, we're, we're coming to the end of our runway with this project. Uh, the Geneva Trade Platform and Task aren't necessarily refugee assistance or migration assistant entities. We know we're strangers in this space, but we also know there are a lot of organizations, including in this room, that aren't. And we're hoping this lights a little bit of a spark and leads to something. So I'm really glad you could all join us. There's no validation quite like a full room. So thank you so much. Dimitri, thank you for that most beautiful personal introduction. I think when we keep it personal, remember why we're here. And I think that is our great power. So that was really beautiful. I now have the pleasure to introduce Raymond Moser, Chief of the Women, Youth and Vulnerable Community Section at the International Trade Center and co-host of today's session for some introductory remarks. Thank you, Raymond. Thank you so much, Claudia. Thank you, Dimitri. Good um, day to everybody here around the world. Uh, welcome on behalf of the International Trade Center to this very exciting workshop. Uh, Dimitri, I don't know whose idea it was. Um, I'm just happy that somebody had the idea and I'm even more happy that you brought us on board as well um, and that we were able to be working with you, the Credit Institute, the GTA and the task team over the last couple of weeks and months to joining our heads and our forces when it comes to this very important topic. So as mentioned, my name is Raymond. I am responsible for ITC section inclusive trade. So that's where we house our programs on she trades, economic empowerment of women, the youth and trade initiative, the ethical fashion initiative, and also of course the REMI program, which stands for the refugees empowerment for market initiative. So ITC started working with refugees and for refugees about eight years ago in 2015, where we had a first project that was fully dedicated to working with, ref with refugees in uh, Eastern Africa and Kenya, Dadaab. And then over ye the years, this uh, project has grown into a practice area and we now have a program here with a small team in Geneva. You see my colleagues here at the table over there. We have uh, Jakob, we have Mai, we have uh, Sandrine. 
We have also the colleagues from the strategy section, Barbara, our chief economist, and Jasmine, who is working with us on also conflict sensitivity analysis. And of course, we have colleagues who are joining us from around the world. Most of our colleagues are indeed in the program countries where we work. We do have them in Kenya, Chilo, who's there um, heading our work in Kenya. She's all in Rwanda. And I think we're going to hear from also Marina, who is uh, joining from Ukraine today. So um, maybe just a little bit of genesis on where we came from initially. So typically at ITC, so for those who are less familiar with the International Trade Center, we are the UN organization and WTO body that is looking at SME competitiveness. What that means is we're supporting small business to connect to markets and then reap the benefits from uh, participating in international trade. So, of course, we are very much market-led and um, uh, trade-led. And so that means we typically start with um, the market and then we work backwards in terms of sectors. What does that mean in terms of products? And then how do we optimize these gains from the different populations that we work with? Now, the rationale for the Remy program has been obviously a little bit different. Um, where we started with the population first. So we started with vulnerable groups. We looked at what are some of the particularities in terms of skills, opportunities, interest, and then we identified market opportunities. And very early in the process, this has taken us to digital opportunities. And so since 2015, we have um, been identifying digital trade as one of the key pathways for creating dignity, for creating opportunity and value for people that have been uh, forcibly displaced. And so um, over time, then um, this, um, we have been working in other sectors as well, but also new programs, including in the ones we started in Ukraine last year, digital opportunities have become a very important one. And um, so it means many different things for us. I mean, we often think about digital opportunities in terms of micro work, connecting to platforms and so on, but it's not just about the um, digital professional services. It's also about e-commerce and how e-commerce matters for particularly people and businesses that have been displaced and uh, living in this displacement and how they can you know, regain and get economic traction. So it, we approach it from different perspectives and of course also looking at how these digital opportunities can then or digital skills can be of benefit for host communities and how we can make those verticals happen between those who have been displaced and those communities that they're residing in. And um, so maybe to just set us um, off, I would like to kind of share with you two or three considerations that have become lessons over time, if you wish, that have become like cornerstones of our programmatic approach when it comes to working with refugees all around the world. And I think they do apply to quite some degree to the context and the discussions we are having today. So first, I would like to just maybe zooming in a little bit on our partnerships with the private sector partners. And we do work a lot with um, different companies, and we have, I believe, quite a number of them also connected online, including Visa, who is funding some of the work, Amazon Web Services, that is a very important market partner for us. And what we have realized is that it's important not just to look at private sector as a off-taker of products or services, but really as a partner. And we have seen an incredible sort of commitment and support to actually supporting the cause of connecting refugees to market. So it's not just about facilitating the market access. Sometimes it's really about making the markets happen, creating the new markets. And we have seen dedicated initiatives also from big online platforms like Amazon Web Services, specifically for um, the refugees we've been working with in, in, um, in Kenya, for instance. And I'm sure that our colleagues from Amazon could uh, contribute more to that in terms of what drives them in terms of commitments and what is the, also the bottom line in terms of business for their, for their interest. Um, but I also want to just kind of park with you that it's important that when we talk to private sector and engage private sector, that we look at the many different roles they play. Private sector also, we see a lot of interest in being, for instance, mentors and coaches and providing pro bono services for people who have been affected by displacement. And so sometimes it's just a matter of, you know, uh, making those connections happen. Uh, we have seen very strong interest, for instance, with one of our funders, Visa, also to support advocacy efforts in making the voices of refugees uh, louder and helping to kind of push important policy changes that need to happen in local ecosystems also at the global scale. So uh, this role of the private sector, multiple levels, is, uh, some, is, end up, is really a partnership that uh, we need to look at uh, to make those um, opportunities happen and importantly to scale them as well. 
Secondly, um, maybe the one thing I would like to park with you as well is that we started quite a high touch or heavy touch with our work with a lot of direct training and support and capacity building in refugee camps. And over time, our strategy has moved more to market systems approaches. So where we're looking at how can we leverage the skills of partners, et cetera, in the different camps or in whoever is working with the refugees and we can focus on market asymmetries and how we can fill those different gaps. And that's uh, in our strategy, uh, something that we want to take forward. And we, are, of course, also in the course of today's session, very interested to hear from you how we can advance that course so that we we know it's a momentous challenge. It's, it's a massive challenge and we need scale and we need to reach scale quickly. So how do we uh, overcome that from a market systems approach? How do we engage ecosystems players like business support organizations that provide services for all kinds of different economic actors and how do we make those services bespoke for refugees? How sometimes it's just a matter of tweaking things a little bit. What does it mean for policy uh, recommendations? And I think that's again, Dimitri, where the work from the Graduate Institute is very pertinent and be interested to hear from you and also learn what that means for policymakers around the world. And the last point I would like to leave with you is um, we are of course very conscious of the partnerships Dimitri, that you've spoken about as well. Um, it's it requires this dovetailing of different efforts. And for us, it's really partnerships among and partnerships within. So at times we also, you know, within the development community, we have here at ITC formidable experts in trade economists and, you know, subject matter experts, but they may not always have the expertise also in servicing, you know, specific groups. And how do we make, how do we convince them, you know, and how do we make those uh, services work better? But also, of course, among different uh, development partners, whether it's, you know, with UNDP, with ILO, with IOM, of course, with UNHCR, et cetera. And among different development partners. I mean, we keep on talking about the nexus, right? We need to be very conscious that we're talking about vulnerabilities and um, social protection is very important. We don't want to push people who are affected by vulnerabilities prematurely into markets or exposing them to market forces that can be detrimental. So how do we dovetail that? How do we sequence it? How do we make sure that complementary measures are in place to, uh, to make that happen? And I think um, the room here that we have today is very I'm very excited to have so many different actors from different um, uh, perspectives approaching this. And um, so very interested to uh, looking forward to contributions and uh, to the discussions. If you allow me just a quick last word, I just see that our director of the division has joined as well. You have Fiona Shera, who's there at the end of the table. She will, she's waving. So welcome Fiona, thanks so much for um, joining. And it also shows how important this topic is for the International Trade Center and for our way uh, for our for our strategy moving forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raymond. That was very powerful and evocative of the possibility that that is already underway and that we can all be contributing to as as we go forward on this on this crucial topic. It is my pleasure to welcome Hobig Etiemezian from the UNHCR, high in demand in this very moment to give a few words about your work from the head of innovation. Um, I can... <laughs> Should I sing now? Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for bringing me in. Uh, it was last minute. Sam Hovik. I've been working for UNHCR now 16, 17 years. Uh, I now head the innovation service for UNHCR. But our, my colleagues' conversations and points took me back to Zatari camp that I was managing in Jordan uh, in 2014, 15, 16. And where I met a Tunisian French entrepreneur, Sofian, who wanted to establish a coding school uh, in Zatari. And at the time, coding was very kind of in trend. Everyone wanted to do coding, uh, upskilling for refugees, uh, thinking that that would really open doors. And uh, Sofian was the only one who was willing to talk about what's next. So you do the upskilling. But then what happens? You know, when you raise expectations, uh, you know, that's it can be sometimes much more dangerous because then 
if you're trained, but you don't have a job, what happens? And he was the only one who was willing to talk about that, the investments needed post upskilling to, um, to really be serious about the subject matter, which is, um, from my standpoint, uh, solutions and uh, self-reliance for refugees and space populations. So that's one thought I had. And we worked with uh, uh, al Bayt University in, in Jordan to establish a coding school for both Jordanians and Syrians, but also looking at pathways for employment post post-graduation models. So that's one thought I want to 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 leave with you. Uh, the second one, fast forward, uh, last year we launched a refugee-led innovation fund in UNHCR. We said enough of us programming on behalf of our clients. If we mean business when it comes to inclusion, we need to open programmatic space for refugees to speak and design their own programs and implement them. Last year in 20, uh, so in 2022, we opened it in 18 countries. We received 1,800 applications from refugee organizations. We only are supporting 17 of those, but uh, those projects based on merit, a, a lot of them are looking at livelihoods and economic kind of economic solutions. So that's another thought that I wanna leave with you. Uh, this year, we opened it globally. We received 3,300 applications. We are in the process of selecting maybe 30, 40, depending on the quality of applications. But from my review, I am already seeing that a lot is on, again, solutions, self-reliant activities and employment opportunities. So that's the second thing I want to uh, leave for you as food for thought. We also last year launched a digital employment uh, program with ILO uh, uh, in Eastern Horn of Africa and Middle East and North Africa. And uh, a lot of it, again, is focusing on digital employment, but also the legal frameworks for digital employment. So I want to touch on that also. And lastly, uh, the fourth point I want to leave you with is, um, is that I just came from our first ever digital uh, gender uh, bootcamp that we launched. And this is to help refugee-led organizations, especially from a gender angle, uh, for them to come up with uh, propositions in the digital space. And no surprise, we have a lot of women-led organizations who applied, and we were selecting a few now uh, um, that are all looking into digital opportunities, basically opportunities for employment and self-reliant activities in the digital space. So these are four kind of scattered examples, but what's next for us? You might know that in December, we have the Global Refugee Forum. And um, the issue of employment and self-reliance and economic activities will feature at the Global Refugee Forum. Uh, and it's a forum that will bring together governments and private sector entities to seriously look at solutions when it comes to refugees, especially those refugees who are in their first asylum countries and they unfortunately stay for a very long period of time and self-reliance is very important. Now, within that framework, there are two events that are very important for us. One, and I will talk about it, is connectivity for refugees because we believe, especially when we're talking uh, about digital, that connectivity is a foundational piece uh, to this. Um, and so we are looking at uh, having a series of events that allow us to bridge that connectivity gap where millions of refugees in space populations don't even have access to the broadband. And so without that, how are we talking about digital opportunities? So that's one. The second thing I want to focus on, and I'll end because I spoke too much, is our digital employment uh, program that we are launching at the GRF, um, which is really looking at all of the matters that you've addressed and a bit more. Uh, we have identified five pillars to this, and I'm not going to stay for the entire session today, but these are, I would leave you with these five kind of areas that we are exploring. One I mentioned, connectivity. So without 
working together on ensuring connectivity where refugees stay. Now, maybe in Switzerland, connectivity might not be an issue, but in many uh, displacement locations, connectivity is a serious issue. And that goes from infrastructure issues all the way to the legal right to have a SIM card. So the first point is connectivity. The second one is access to hardware and software. That is a huge gap in many of refugee uh, situations for which uh, on these both these points, th these are serious investments at government and donor level, World Bank level, where if we really want to solve connectivity and access to devices, meaning smartphones and laptops and and also software, the rest is very difficult to 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 attain. Now, refugees in Zatari camp were better at, at hacking our Wi-Fi uh, than our own colleagues. So they had easier access to our Wi-Fi than our guests in our compound, but they had devices. In many places, that is not the case. So that's the second point. The third point is something that there is a lot of work on, which is upskilling. Um, so this is both the formal graduation models, but also all of the activities that look into upskilling of refugees. I think here what we, we want to focus on this, but with a pathway of what is next. So upskilling alone for us is, and I gave the example, is it can be dangerous because you do that and then you leave the rest of the stuff to others. And you have refugees hanging in that space where they have been upskilled, but they don't have any opportunities. So the third point is upskilling, where there, a lot of work needs to be done. The fourth point is matching. So the idea of, you talked about AWS, which also we are uh, working with, the idea of having the global employers meeting the global displaced. How do we bring those to closer together so that those opportunities that are there can be harnessed. I want to give two examples. Finland is missing around 130,000 jobs in the tech sector. A lot of them can be done remotely. Uh, they can't find their education system in the country doesn't generate enough, basically, uh, graduates to fill those jobs. Uh, yet somehow they're not being able to employ refugees remotely. So that kind of the matching between the employers and the potential um, uh, the potential that we have within the space communities. And last is financial inclusion. So do refugees have the right to work? Do they have an access to a bank account? And can they get a fair remuneration? So that's the fifth pillar. So we would want, to, I invite you to think of these five pillars when you're thinking about solutions in the digital space for refugees, uh, our willingness is extended to collaborate. We want to form an alliance of like-minded entities who would want to work with us um, to maybe have the Global Refugee Forum as a pedestal to talk about this and have a multi-year plan to address these issues. So very excited to be part of this. Thank you and happy to answer any questions. Hobig, thank you so much for this very practical and important contribution. I, I love your focus on connectivity in particular and how that feeds across all of the different priorities and how it feeds across with the work of the ITC um, and the different platforms who are here today. And I think we should also always remember our own roles as connectors. You know, connector, connectivity as the route to peace. I mean, this is, it's even existential beyond just the mechanics and the hardware. Um, so this is, this is wonderful. And, and how apt that I get to introduce the greatest connector I know. I once uh, was uh, Tobias's teacher, and now I am one of his most supportive students. Um, so today, Tobias, it is really a pleasure for those of you who don't know him, please, please try because he will help you in your life. Tobias Drilling, research collaborator at the Center for Trade and Economic Integration, Geneva Trade Platform and Task Platform. And he'll be sharing the findings and policy recommendations of the Telework for Refugees research project. Tobias, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Claudia, and thank you for being here. And 
Yes, so we will dive more into the context of Switzerland. And I think many points that you mentioned, Hovik, actually are also in our recommendations. So I'm really happy to see this reflected um, with different actors working in this field. Um, could I have the first slide, please? Um, so it's a great pleasure to share our findings. Um, to start the input, I want, and to set the scene a bit, I want to start um, with a quote of Ivan, who is a Ukrainian refugee here in Switzerland. I'm not sure if you can read it, but otherwise I'll read it to you anyways. I want to live like any other person, work, spend money for my family, rent an apartment with my own money, take care of the health insurance with my own money, the opportunity to buy a car for my family. I think it's normal. It's the same for everybody. I have to think about the future of my children and of my family. So Ivan seeks opportunity to find a gainful employment, to live a dignified life and to sustain his family. And when it comes to refugees in Switzerland, Ivan is one of many. Nevertheless, according to a Swiss-wide survey just last year in 2022, only about 15% of Ukrainian refugees seeking protection here in Switzerland have found a gainful employment. So highly skilled people that are unable to work, but why so? And to explain a bit this why, I want to focus on one word that came up in almost every conversation and interview, which is uncertainty or insecurity. And this uncertainty has many different levels and dimensions. So for people seeking refuge, it is on the one side the uncertainty of the situation in their country of origin, um, the constant fear of losing someone back home, a family member, a friend, but also then at the same time, the uncertainty of being in their, their presence in Switzerland, being here, um, not knowing if it's temporary, if it's long-term, if it's permanent. So these short-term permits, um, for Ukrainians, for example, they are only renewed every year. So this means every year the question comes up again. Can I stay for the next year? Should I settle down? Should I build a network in Switzerland? And then on the side of the employer, we also have the uncertainty. So will a hired refugee whose maybe long-term permit status and home country situation is unclear, be a good investment for the organization? Are the language skills, are their qualifications obtained in another country sufficient for work? With this, we want to move to telework and digital livelihoods as a possible solution for at least some of these challenges. For refugees who already have the skills or who will obtain the skills, um, that can be used for digital work. Digital livelihoods also offer governments a potential shift of perspective, recasting refugee populations as hidden talents and undiscovered entrepreneurs. So workly, working remotely offers different ways for on the one side, gainful employment to travel with the refugee in case they have to move around, to bridge the supply and demand on the labor market, to offer at least some certainty um, in one aspect of the refugee's life, and at the same time also benefit the global economy. And also, and also most importantly in the end, with digital livelihoods, we're actively shaping, shaping the future of work and providing skilled labor forces for the many transitions that are awaiting us. So the potential of digital and remote work, alongside with the challenges that are highlighted by our inter interviews with refugees, um, accessing these skills and working opportunities in Switzerland led us to formulate a set of preliminary um, policy recommendations for discussion in the later half of this workshop. These recommendations are divided into four sectors. So we have the state, we have the private sector, we have international organizations and we have NGOs. And I want to stress that while we take this sectoral approach, it is in the end crucial and the progress will require the collaboration in between these sectors and partnerships across sectors. Our recommendations are grouped by the most relevant actors, but nevertheless, there are many more important actors and sectors that all have a play. 
Um, yes, thank you for the slide. So I will just briefly touch upon all of these recommendations and we will discuss them then in the later part. So with regards to the state, we actually identified two main challenges that translate into policy recommendations that are reflected well in what Hovik shared before as well. So the first challenge is that there are very few work upskilling programs in Switzerland, mainly we focus on Geneva and Switzerland, um, that include digital options and highlight the possibilities of digital livelihoods. Um, because to navigate remote job market also requires a unique set of skills and qualifications. So there is not only the need to focus on technical skills, but furthermore also the soft skills that enable um, working within a remote team. This is why we propose a digital integration program pilot um, whereby an existing jo um, refugee job insertion program, um, such as, for example, the Jomage in Switzerland or in Geneva, is expanded to include digital um, working opportunities. And then the second challenge is that the trans transition from this upskilling trainings and workshops to the first working experiences is lacking mostly. So we propose a job matching online work insertion program. Um, this would see state institu institutions to broaden and wider their existing work insertion and job placement partnerships to include and directly connect refugees with online working opportunities. And one of the core advantages of focusing on digital livelihoods in this would then be that we're actually broadening up the um, potential employers pool to a global level. For the private sector, um, we observe an increasing interest um, in hiring refugee talent and supporting them, as you also mentioned, Raymond. And so, but nevertheless, there is a need for more awareness of the opportunities, of the training, of adopting policies and institutionalizing this access to work for refugees. So therefore, we first propose a review of the internal remote work policies to ensure that they are open to and inclusive of refugee populations. And then secondly, we propose to enhance opportunities by improving the recognition of skills. So concretely, this means to broadening the hiring criteria to recognize or convert or then also adapt a broader range of foreign qualifications to local standards and consider where experience or skills may be equivalent to formal qualification. So this recommendation is really about giving skilled displaced people opportunities for their first working experience in a new context, which will then open the door for further working experiences and gainful employment. With regards to international organizations, we see and we observe more and more, and we have many of you in the room, of international organizations that are working on digital livelihoods for refugees and asylum seekers. And there are, of course, already many existing collaborations amongst all of you and all of us. And still there is much potential to institutionalize um, these collaborations on a global scale, which is why we um, propose the creation of a collaboration hub on digital livelihoods for refugees to improve the connectivity, uh, the collaboration and the knowledge sharing amongst all of these organizations um, working on digital livelihoods for refugees. This hub would offer an institutionalized way of sharing knowledge, of co-learning as well, as it's a topic that is coming more and more and is more and more on an agenda, and then establishing the best practices necessary to create this inclusive future of work. A recommendation for NGOs on a local Geneva-based level that actually came up from our first workshop at the Future of Work Summit um, is a digital work local hub. So with many asylum seekers and refugee also here in Geneva living in crowded, small and loud housing, there is a need to create new spaces that are dedicated to supporting refugees and other job seekers in, first of all, upskilling, then finding online work opportunities and co-work in the end online in a common space. 
The second recommendation to NGOs is to keep on amplifying and increasing the advocacy for inclusion in digital livelihoods. This means advocating for the inclusion of refugees in online work platforms and opportunities that are promoting diversity, expanding the talent pool for employers, and advocating for a skills first approach after all. So these are our recommendations. And through our project and what we see today, we have experienced the depth of interest from all and many of the stakeholders working on this topic. And we believe that this interest and this momentum that we have at the moment also brings the responsibility to act now, expanding on the topic and setting it on a global agenda um, as a possible solution to solve some of the challenges that we face today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tobias. Very interesting. We have a lot of work uh, cut out for us for the rest of this session. I see you're all listening attentively. This is great. I hope you're all doing well. I'm very happy to be able to introduce the next part of this session. So this is where we have our three online speakers speaking about their own lived firsthand experiences. And so I'm sure this can be for us one of the most powerful parts of our session today. Um, First, I have the great pleasure of introducing Marina Siordorenko, National Project Manager in Ukraine at the International Trade Center. Marina is joining us online from Kiev and shares ITC's work of linking inter internally displaced persons in Ukraine to upskilling trainings and employment opportunities in the digital trade. Marina, thank you so much for being here. We are listening attentively here in Geneva. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, do you hear me? I'm good. Hello. Hello. Right. We can hear you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you so much. Yes. My name is Marina Sturenka and I have been the national project manager for uh, the ITC project in Ukraine since 2017. I'd like to dedicate my anti-dictionary uh, right uh, to where bowling issues a uh, large scale uh, displacement. Uh, nowadays, uh, Ukraine is uh, all over the news and uh, often the refugees uh, are mentioned. The uh, staggering 13.5 uh, million people uh, displaced, but in reality, this is just one third of the total population, uh, those who were uprooted inside and outside the country, according to uh, IOM data. Uh, at the beginning of the war, me and my family were also uh, forced to flee the city that was uh, on the edge of the siege and relocate uh, to the western of Ukraine. Uh, with constant and uh, intensified shelling of Kyiv, uh, supply and logistics routes uh, in and out, uh, the city became more uh, abrupt uh, uh, due to checkpoints. And uh, I didn't know if I would be able to get my mother and mother-in-law to bring food and uh, medicine uh, every next day. We stayed in the evacuation for three months and returned to Kyiv to help others as well. By the time Kyiv looked half empty, more than two million people left it and only about a million remained. Uh, Kyiv Z uh, is usually popular for its uh, vibrancy turn into host town. I want to go deeply uh, into challenges faced uh, by refugees. I would rather explain what happened to the economy was, uh, when so many people have been relocated and uh, how our project uh, was brought into the play. Uh, the title of our project is Ukraine Building Economic Resilience of Displacement Affected Communities. Uh, they are financed by the government uh, of Japan and uh, is quite short and um, designed for certain skills. Uh, but uh, but we are hoping to get uh, next round. So uh, the project has three main pillars. Uh, the first one supports relocated uh, uh, SMEs from uh, all over Ukraine. 
It consists uh, training for more than uh, 200 enterprises and uh, its aim at exploring for possibilities of e-commerce. Destroyed enterprises, uh, the force to transfer uh, of their capacities to other regions and uh, the uh, relocation of employees to save regions and other countries make enterprises uh, explore alternative ways of production and trade of their products uh, while remaining in Ukraine. So first pillar supports alternative routes uh, for Ukrainian enterprises by uh, connecting them with um, markets. Among them as uh, such international uh, world famous um, marketplace as Amazon, eBay, Etsy, Zalanda, uh, Otto, Ball, uh, Kaufland, and, and other. Now e-commerce e uh, is coming to force, but in Ukraine, it's not just a global trend that has been rapidly developing in peacetime. It's a vital necessity for economic recovery and business revival. To support the SMEs, uh, uh, we work with the Youth Digital Initiative and, of course, with local partners as the national network uh, for enterprises, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, DIA business under uh, the leadership of the Ministry of Digital Transf Transformation of Ukraine and the Entrepreneurship and uh, Expert Promotion Office. So we certainly know then we, when help SMEs, uh, we help IDPs as well. Despite training uh, even a very few in, uh, enterprises today, we can get a spillover effect tomorrow, which will not only affect uh, uh, other enterprises in their recovery, but also giving millions of Ukrainians jobs uh, boosting the country's uh, economy. But it works the other way around too. Uh, let me explain by telling you about the second pillar. The second pillar, it's uh, support for IDPs and their IT and professional skills. Uh, the displacement of Ukrainians uh, uh, continues today within the country and outside. Those who are returning from the other countries, especially women, are forced to look for new jobs since uh, they most probably lost their previous uh, jobs in Ukraine for various reasons. Uh, the number and the types of uh, profession in demand in peacetime uh, decreases in war time, and many people are looking for a replacement, so new training and retraining. So uh, today we, uh, with the help uh, of NGO Projector, it's a Ukrainian online study platform. We have already trained 63 conflict affected Ukrainian women um, for the uh, purpose of uh, development and educational uh, qualification and career support for professionally participate in marketing and uh, IT fields. In wartime condition, when many people don't have the opportunity to work offline, remote work is in agreement. Uh, as training outcome, some of the participants have already found new jobs. It's it's great. Uh, if I have time at the end of my speech, uh, I can give some examples. Uh, so we had different participants, including who played East uh, and South of Ukraine uh, and students who are now also difficult to find jobs. So uh, they are forced to undergo retraining. Uh, the third pillar uh, of the project stands uh, territorial community support. This uh, direction combines uh, both support for SMEs and IDPs, uh, and support for the entire community as well, addressing integration of IDPs and their skills and galvanizing local communities uh, to have a business vision. Today's IDPs can be future entrepreneurs, and now we have quite enough of such examples. 
this is why it's so important uh, to support both IDPs and SMEs. Uh, this is our uh, interconnected uh, process. Um, here are uh, the examples uh, of the most notable uh, issues uh, that uh, communities face based uh, on the survey and uh, the training uh, that have been done. Many IDPs are looking for opportunities to become entrepreneurs, but they lack uh, the professional skills to do so. Relocated or just local businesses um, in communities often also lack professional skills in strategy, business planning, marketing, and others. At the same time, business sometimes develops faster than the community itself, and uh, there is a development conflict in this. Our partner in this program is RDA, uh, RDA uh, Tavri Regional Development Agency. This agency is that before the full-scale war and uh, the destruction of the Kachovka Dam was located in Nova Kachovka in the south of Ukraine and was forced to leave this beautiful region where I also spent my childhood there. RDA has a successful business uh, as a lead of craft food companies uh, developed the communities of the southern region, including by exchanging experience with foreign communities. So being, them, being themselves IDPs, they are uh, as leader for creating champions for businesses, uh, business integration for IDPs. The war forced them to move a nose in Ukraine, Oman region, where they now work supporting other communities, SME, SMEs and IDPs in three regions and five communities. And now it's a partner, uh, it's a partner in our project. Sorry, but I, I fortunately I have a, a limited time for my speech uh, to add a few more uh, example, but we have them enough. I'm proud to say that our project address uh, addresses uh, all this uh, issue, and we're looking on the addressing other uh, concerns. I'm grateful to our donor the government of Japan for the opportunity to help uh, the Ukrainian people and state and raising uh, the country's economic in such a difficult time for us. Thanks everyone for your attention. Marina, thank you so much for your powerful testimony, for reminding us as well that with this work with refugees, we must also keep in mind people who are displaced internally. Uh, so that message has been very, um, very carefully noted here in the room. Um, and we look forward to hearing more about your experiences in, in group discussions and next stages of this process that has been started here. So thank you very much. Um, thank you. So now we're going to move on to Filipa, Filipa Matos, who is the VP of Special Operations at Remote, an HR platform for global teams. Filipa shares Remote's efforts of facilitating the working contract transitions for Ukrainian displaced people living abroad and Remote's efforts for refugees. Filipa, the screen and microphone are now yours. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me today. Uh, my name is Filipa and I am the Vice President of Special Operations at Remote. I've been working at Remote for the past four years and I'm super grateful for having the opportunity to tell you a bit about Remote and our overall vision that is bigger than our mission as part of the private sector. So maybe um, let me start by explaining a bit about Remote. So what we do, in a nutshell, we have established our own entities all over the globe uh, to allow companies to employ talent compliantly, regardless of their location. So if the talent is based in one of the countries we support, then we can support the organization to offer an employment agreement dealing with statutory benefits and all compliance matters related to dignified employment. So the genesis of remote uh, was forged from a clear-cut necessity to redefine the world of work by removing geographical barriers that limited opportunities 
for both individuals and businesses alike. So our founders perceived the unwarranted constraints that location placed on hiring talent and were inspired to devise a solution that would bridge this gap, uh, leveraging the potential of the digital landscape to foster connections that transcended borders. Um, regarding the specific initiatives and programs that we have developed uh, to support refugees, the inception of our Remote for Refugees program stands as a testament to our dedication because by the end of the day, um, our, our journey doesn't stop at merely providing a platform and infrastructure. So we want to impact on everyone's life and uh, guarantee that this world of work is accessible for everyone. And we've been collaborating with international organizations like UNHCR and ILO, several governments around the globe, NGOs like NAMAL, who supports refugees through skills training uh, and the specific program for remote work. And we've been able to broaden our horizons and work towards a globally inclusive remote working environment. So let me tell you a bit about Remote for Refugees program. Uh, under this initiative, we waive our fees uh, when a company uses our platform to employ a refugee, facilitating a seamless and cost-effective way to extend opportunities to those looking to get back on their feet. In 2022 alone, we assisted global organizations in employing around 200 refugees. Remarkably, which we found super interesting, half of these were not enrolled under our pro bono offer. And that was kind of surprising to us. Uh, so we wanted to understand why. And this was a choice made by these companies desiring to treat all employees with equal reverence and uplifting testaments to the underlying principles of equity and fairness in the global work culture. So ensuring that refugees, including those from Ukraine, have the necessary skills and resources begins with accessibility. And our partnership with the Portuguese government was a pivotal step where we utilize our expertise with visa processes to streamline the refugees' welcome process, ensuring the removal of unnecessary bureaucratic hurdles. This intervention enabled the Ukrainian refugees to obtain vital documents such as tax and social security numbers immediately upon arrival, allowing them to commence work from day one and thereby fast tracking their path to economic uh, stability and self-reliance. As a result of this, Portugal welcomed more than 50,000 Ukrainian refugees in 2022 and several local organizations from public to private sector worked together to match this talent with work opportunities and also provided accommodation and schools in the same cities where these refugees were being employed. So from this specific example, uh, it's, it's very important to say that collaboration with governments and NGOs is foundational to uh, remote strategy in terms of impact on the future and present of work. In addition to advising on efficient processes, our collaboration with entities like the Portuguese government extends to the working hand in hand to identify opportunities and create channels that facilitate quicker integrations into the workforce, leveraging the digital landscape to the fullest. And while the numbers are a testimony to our collective efforts, the real success is witnessed in the individual stories of resilience, determination, and the blossoming of new opportunities for those who had to leave their homes in search of safety and stability. Our journey is continuous, and we remain dedicated to evolving our strategies and to help the different governments and international organizations to reaching out and offering a hand of opportunity to refugees globally, focusing on a future of inclusivity, diversity, and above all, dignity in work. 
And I would like to close my intervention by proposing a way forward. Skills training and upskilling is for sure important and potentially step number one. But removing barriers to accessing dignified employment opportunities is vital and the next step we need to focus on. One of the main blockers from our experience is, for, is to be granted the right to work in refugees hosting countries. And at Remote, our vision for the future is grounded in fostering a world that embraces the universal right to remote work. We are envisioning a landscape where inclusivity and accessibility are not just buzzwords, but elements of the work culture globally. This right to remote work isn't limited to certain demographies, um, but extends seamlessly to include refugees, enabling them to leverage job opportunities from companies based outside their host country, and thereby stand back on their feet with dignity and independence. Achieving universal access to remote work is for sure a collaborative endeavor. So governments can play a decisive role by formulating policies that facilitate remote work across borders, focusing on equitable access to digital infrastructures, like the ones that Tobias mentioned as uh, recommendations, and removing bureaucratic barriers to international remote working. The policy implications extend from revisiting visa regulations to tax implications for international remote working and thereby setting a foundation that nurtures cross-border employment opportunities. NGOs, on the other hand, can bridge gaps by offering skill development programs and awareness campaigns highlighting the opportunities that platforms out there can offer. In conclusion, the universal right to remote work is just not an idea. It is a movement towards a future where opportunities are not bound by geographical locations, but by skill and talent. So this is a call for a world that acknowledges and practices inclusivity at every step, offering a canvas of opportunities that is as wide and diverse as our global community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philippa. This was very powerful. You would be happy to know that our government and UN bodies present in the room were taking notes. There was much <laughs> head nodding as you provided a way forward. So very practical. And, and I think we have some very serious players in this room who are willing to go forward with you and other members of the private sector as we make put, put words into action. Uh, so thank you, Philippa. Thank our you. third speaker is... Victoria Finnegan, a mental health, social support, and integration counselor. Victoria is a trained psychologist, and as a lived experience as a Ukrainian refugee in Switzerland, she has turned her experience into coaching and counseling refugees in Switzerland and helping people to find work here. Victoria, thank you so much for being here, and we look forward to hearing your, your experience and the wisdom that we can learn from it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I am a uh, yes, psychologist and uh, it's a priority for me to uh, see that uh, people now, migrants and uh, from Ukraine and from other countries, they are uh, stable and open for work opportunity and they uh, have mental health uh, and physical health uh, all in balance. And uh, I would like to say that I'm from Kiev, from Ukraine, and physically I am now reside in Zurich, in Switzerland, and mentally I'm in Ukraine and in Switzerland. So I do everything possible to support Ukrainians in the way as I can. And um, uh, currently I work with... Gloria, I'm sorry, can I interrupt yes. you? Yeah. Could you speak perhaps closer to the microphone and a little bit louder because we're picking up yes. noise? So I was invited today Thank you. To, to, share, uh, to share my practical experience in Switzerland uh, in these times. And uh, last year I uh, support a refugee uh, that uh, is the status S uh, that evacuated from Ukraine uh, 
uh, during the project Stay with Ukraine. And uh, that gave me opportunity to deliver all information about Switzerland, about all the uh, process settle down, how to register and uh, help uh, people in uh, urgent queries. And uh, this year I work with also with NGO or online. Uh, also, that um, I have completed course here for uh, traumatic people with traumatic experience to support people and uh, uh, help them with social integration. Uh, this is online job and uh, not only for status S uh, for uh, N, F, and other refugees. And also, uh, I'm part of uh, now uh, working with um, discrimination and uh, other issues for refugees. And I have now uh, started also offline uh, inside job with helping people with disabilities to support in uh, every uh, day uh, needs. Uh, so I would like to say that um, that gave me uh, entrance to uh, see how everything organized here and uh, it's quite different from uh, how things organized in Ukraine, in healthcare, in uh, other legal uh, authorities and uh, also in other processes. And um, first of all, uh, that uh, I would like to help people uh, that uh, are looking for a job uh, to uh, match to organize a, a basically translation uh, between market in Ukraine and uh, all the ground uh, to uh, Swiss labor market. Uh, as uh, I had this experience that gave me understanding of these um, differences. And uh, uh, first of all, uh, like uh, stress factors very important uh, and uh, I think psychology uh, wo work of psychologists uh, is important uh, uh, for every refugee uh, to understand uh, what is the situation today uh, and the goals and the interest of uh, future work. Uh, in Switzerland, uh, a lot of authorities uh, providing programs like I already hear from other speakers today, yes, upgrade skills uh, and uh, different courses, like for example, you can, a uh, Swiss Ukrainian program, also access fast track that I'm starting today, this program also uh, for migrants uh, with uh, refugee and other migrants and uh, to help them um, integrate in Switzerland and find work. And uh, I can say that uh, as a mental health specialist, it's important always uh, to uh, balance between uh, body and mind. And this is uh, all like health system. That's why uh, my point of view, it's important to combine jo uh, job in our online and offline too. And uh, so not only looking for online opportunities, but combination, it gives uh, much more practical and uh, theoretical also experience, skills, and uh, for integration is very important. And uh, uh, I also, my advice would be uh, look for today, uh, what um, I can do today for uh, my career tomorrow, but today that I can invest in myself whatever uh, I can uh, to, um, to have this um, investment that brings me to next level uh, and uh, uh, it uh, could be in Switzerland or in Ukraine or in other country but it's important today what I can do. A lot of people now have a, a, a syndrome of postponing life as uh, they still waiting that uh, some changes bring for them um, uh, like another opportunity and this only uh, makes them wait and make it worse for a uh, psychological uh, perspective and health and it total and uh, I was uh, yesterday participate in workshop uh, for people with disabilities uh, like in industrial uh, state uh, and um, I saw how it organized process and uh, Switzerland really very well organized uh, a lot of uh, process uh, with uh, details with uh, all uh, participants in this process and uh, 
My question is, is Switzerland really interested uh, that people integrate the status S or other refugee? But I would uh, be more specific with status S, Ukrainian, because we have a limit of time now. And uh, I don't have answer on this question. From my experience is uh, uh, system organized uh, in a way that Ukrainians receive here social uh, welfare benefits uh, for uh, health insurance and also uh, like money for life. And uh, as uh, I spoke with a lot of Ukrainians, they uh, really afraid to lose these uh, like benefits. Uh, because the uh, system organized, if person start working, all benefits uh, not supported anymore, and uh, should uh, themselves pay for all health insurance and uh, uh, basically for the house, for the flat, uh, uh, and other expenses. And it's in Switzerland very very high uh, demanding um, cost, and uh, like. Um, these fears make people to wait and not uh, really be active. And uh, it's a, uh, I can find it's a problem, lack of motivation. And actually from both sides, like from both of government and from both of uh, refugee. And this is a problem number one. And um, uh, a lot of people uh, also I know uh, who active, who would like to do something now, they uh, started with NGO, they open NGO, basically it's charity work, and the uh, open NGO gives them activities, they can uh, also, I know, Swiss Ukrainians NGO that uh, promoting Ukrainian culture in Switzerland, and it's great. And uh, problem number one, they're looking for fundraising, and this is a really important issue in Switzerland, as I uh, basically myself have a lot of ideas uh, for uh, children, Ukrainian children with uh, cancer, for example, that need psychological support uh, regularly on a regular basis, and uh, also uh, women support uh, like uh, activity, also uh, different kind of therapy that I actually uh, have um, different methodics after methodics, and uh, this all needs fundraising. So this is question number one to match actually uh, sponsorship in Switzerland with. Uh, creative uh, ideas of Ukrainians uh, that can, or other uh, people that have these ideas and uh, start would like to start uh, do some start up or uh, other activities uh, in place and uh, I think a lot of organizations they're looking for such uh, projects and important to organize so organize matching this is uh, I think problem number two uh, fundraising also, uh, it's a new country, Switzerland. For uh, basically, uh, I like is that I know Switzerland for 20 years. I have uh, worked before in uh, Swiss companies and also study German before. I uh, live in a German speaking uh, part of Switzerland. And uh, this gave me an opportunity to understand uh, Switzerland before I um, reside here. And actually, for people that uh, arrive uh, and uh, doesn't know how system regulate here, it's important to understand uh, rules, uh, uh, rights, and uh, actually organization and law regulation. And that's why uh, it's a uh, lack of social, basically social legal advisor uh, here. So I find it's a few NGO have that, but uh, a big uh, waiting list and. Uh, also language barriers, so they need translator, and that's all uh, separate area that legal, basic advisor, that also connected to labor market to understand rights, uh, employee rights, completely different. Here, a lot of uh, health and safety, fire safety, so it's a lot of different regulation here with the packages, with the pillars of insurance, pension fund, uh, insurance, so it's a completely different uh, system. And it needs a legal advisor that, uh, for startup or for freelancer or for employee. Victoria, also, yes. Thank you, Victoria. You have such a rich list of, of recommendations. And I, again, people are taking notes actively here. Regrettably, we are out of time, yes. uh, but I would like to make sure that the organizing team here continues the discussion so that we document these really important interventions that you are offering up in the shared space. Um, I think your focus, very practical, legal, economic job, the question of are we really committed to integrating refugees or not, these are all crucial uh, 
questions that we need to be posing and getting honest answers to. Um, and as well, your focus on the mental health of refugees. I think we've heard this common theme with expectations, with dignity, with uncertainty, that we should always keep this most human um, aspect in, in the front of our minds when we're designing these policies and opening up markets and, and all the rest of the crucial work that we're doing. So, Victoria, I, we will continue conversations in exchange. Thank you very much for, for being here and for, for sharing your perspectives with us as well. Yes, just uh, concerning, I would like to say uh, that uh, I'm really open I'm, uh, for helping Ukraine, Ukrainians and uh, Swiss Ukrainian co uh, cooperation and uh, to find, uh, to help uh, people to find their way. And uh, my suggestion would be uh, create a separate unit that will uh, take care of all these uh, subjects. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Victoria. Thank you so much to you, Victoria, to Filipa, to Marina, who joined us online. Um, I now have this great privilege to, I know some of you are looking at your watches, so we're going to be as, as respectful of your time as we possibly can. Um, for those of you who don't know, yes, Min Chaudhry, Project Manager at the Center for Trade and Economic Integration, Geneva Trade Platform and Task Platform for the Telework of Refugees Research Project. Yes, Mina, thank you for organizing such a beautiful session, so important for your leadership, getting us all together. The floor is now yours to explain what is going to be happening in the last part of the session. Um, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you, Claudia, for framing and moderating the, the whole workshop so uh, fittingly. Before I introduce the next part of the workshop, we are running a good five to ten minutes late. So if we can ask for 10 minutes more of your time, if you would like to continue the discussion part of the session. For those who have to go, we completely understand. I hope again, one minute of your time to meet Raymond properly. And after you can go, sorry. <laughs> um, but we have designed the workshop in such a way that we have uh, four sectors, the state, the who is here represented. We have um, Florence Seychaux from Hospice General today. Um, and we encourage you to join her in the conversation and analyze one of the um, policy recommendations. We have divided each table to have a sector. So we have the NGO sector at the back with uh, Ketrona, lead, led by Ketrona. And we have the international organizations uh, tables here on table three and five. Um, sorry, on table three, led by Mai, who will come a bit forward. And uh, we will do another group to talk about state. I'm not forgetting all our friends online who will be discussing the private sector um, uh, impact and the private sector policy recommendation. I will keep it short. The idea for us is really to test those policy recommendations. We've done six months of research. We've come up with ideas that are mirrored in each of your work already. Uh, Raymond Hovig from ITC and NHCR, but we at this stage need to make sure that across sectors um, they make sense and we deliberately want you to discuss them, debate them, dissect them, find flaws so we can produce a better report afterwards. Um, thank you for your time and up to you. Such guys. a regret to interrupt these excellent conversations. Welcome back. So one thing I would encourage all tables to do, share your business cards now. Because as we know, the our job here is to be connectors. And clearly, we've only just started the conversations. Um, there is much work to be done. So let us commit to staying in touch and to keeping this agenda going forward. Um, if I could also take my privilege as moderator there are some research ideas in here, offshoots of what you've already been doing, um, that the Applied Research Projects Program of the Graduate Institute would be very happy to take forward with our own student groups. Um, so for any of you interested in doing Applied Research Projects with master's students at the Graduate Institute, we are receiving partner applications due next week, the 19th of September. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, it's really a wonderful opportunity to get some, some work done by our students for such important research as what you are doing. Um, so today has been just such a, a special moment together. I would like to thank all of you for being here. Some very important conversations have been happening. 
have been continuing and will continue going forward. Um, so thank you all. I would like to uh, introduce or bring you back, Yasmin, to, to give a nice closing to this, this special moment that we've been able to share together. Thank you, Claudia, and thank you, everyone. I'm sorry we had to cut the conversation short. So as we conclude today's workshop, I find myself humbled by the last six months of the research, which has been infused with conversations and reflections, and has been inspired by each colleague that has shared their work um, on refugee empowerment. At the heart of the research lies the 20 plus um, interviews that Tobias has carried with the affected population, with re Ukrainian refugees here settled in Switzerland. Um, so thank you to them to have been like the vehicle for that research at, at first. Uh, from large-scale large, large scale international programs by the ITC and the UNHCR to the incredible work carried out right here in Geneva by other and across Switzerland, thanks to the Hospice Générale, the research project gave us an insight into this exciting emerging space. It allowed us to concretely explore and assess the role of digital trade and telework as a lifeline for refugees and its potential for enabling them to rebuild their lives in new and innovative ways and provide them with an opportunity for dignity. The drive for this workshop came from Professor Richard Baldwin. He was the one who championed the idea of unlocking telework for refugees and on how to make it accessible in practical terms. So it's by mobilizing the Center for Trade and Economic Integration at the Geneva Graduate Institute and through its two main platforms, the Thinking Ahead on Societal Change Platform task and the Geneva Trade Platform that has happened. So both of these platforms, and it took me six months to understand that, <laughs> is that they address different facets of what multilateralism is all about with labor for task and trade for GTP. And they do so by building bridges between actors, as we've seen today. And they also power and actually drive all the resources and expertise by breaking down silos between sectors that traditionally may not find the space or language to do that. And this is something that we have seen today. Adjust my mic. Sorry. <laughs> so... Um, so with the task platform back in June at the Future of Work Summit, we were able to test the idea of digital livelihoods and its potential life-changing impact for refugee populations. We actively sought out, tested and shared insights on how to drive joined up solution-oriented thinking that is shaped by multi-stakeholder collaborations. So... As the Geneva Trade Platform is all about translating trade in turbulent times, this year's Geneva Trade Week provided the perfect framework for us and for our research project to do just that. And that's thanks to each of you today, thanks to everyone online as well, um, that we were able to dissect, dissect some of our proposed policy guidelines and explore potential stakeholder collaboration opportunities. We just saw that happening with ITC and UNHCR right away. So we were now able to get one step closer to advocating for access to telework, digital services and trade as a path towards integration and empowerment for refugee populations. So on behalf of Tobias and myself, I would like to once again thank our panelists here in the room and online for generously sharing their expertise. Um, without this, we will not be able to have a research project to conduct today. I would like to thank all of you for taking the time to join us today and actively engaging in this workshop and contributing to the depth and diversity of our conversation. And what we've heard from all our panelists today is what's next? What, how are we carrying this, this forward? In the hope that the dialogue on digital livelihoods for refugee populations will carry beyond, we look forward to sharing with you all, um, with you all a, ses a session summary capturing today's exchange and towards that would be towards the end of October, as well as our research findings. But more on that, we would like to take the opportunity to invite you to share and send any information about your work 
initiatives and organization that you would like to share with a wider group that would incorporate into our research findings? So the unlocking, the initiative for unlocking telework for refugees um, lasted about six months and it has undoubtedly started to demonstrate the value of a greater collaboration for the need for a centralized form of exchange and the creation of a community in this space. One such space, for example, can take the shape of the creation of a collaboration hub on digital livelihoods for refugees right here in Geneva, as mentioned by Tobias a bit earlier. So we therefore invite you to help us find ways to strengthen the ecosystem and hopefully continue the dialogue that have been going on strong for the past six months. So stay tuned, stay in touch, and thank you. Everyone is welcome to have sandwich, drink, chocolate chip cookies, which have just arrived, um, that are outside. So please continue the conversations if you can, and we look forward to staying in touch. Thank you.